Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Unlock the Stock event. These monthly sessions are specifically formulated for retail investors to gain access to corporate management and get to know them and their companies better. This event is proudly sponsored by CUDA, an insurance and ethics services group. CUDA has made a significant footprint in their niche markets, specifically bloodstock, sport horse and game. CUDA has meticulously built the company into being South Africa's leading luxury lifestyle insurer and forex service provider. Visit their website www.cuda.coza to meet the team and read more about the services they offer. Our hosts will be the Finance Ghost and Mark Tobin from Coffee Micrograps this afternoon and they will be facilitating the breakout rooms at the end of the presentation session of this event. We would like to welcome ATTAC, represented by Jackie Van Nickerk, CEO, and Raj Nana, CFO, and they are joined by some of the execs, and Capital Appreciation, represented by Brad Sachs and Michael Pimstein, joint CEOs, as well as Alan Solomon, CFO. Before we commence, a couple of housekeeping rules. Each company will do a presentation of 12 minutes each. Thereafter, you will see a button on the bottom of your screen where you can select which breakout room you would like to join to ask questions to management. You are more than welcome to leave the one room and join the other room by making a selection using the breakaway room function. Please note that you will only be allowed to post your questions by typing them into the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Please also note that this event has been recorded and will be available on Caterick Investor Solutions YouTube channel as are the past Unlock the Stocks events, so be sure and subscribe to this channel. Once in the breakout room, you will see an email address if you would like to, add, to be added to that company's distribution list. I now hand you over to Jackie van Niekerk, CEO of Attack. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm joined here with Raj Nana, our CFO, Michael Clampett, our Asset Management Executive, David Wister is the newly appointed Development Executive, and then Pete De Villiers, our CEO, and I think some of my other colleagues are also online. So good morning to everyone. Um, attack explained. Um, what is attack? We thought, let's start in a nutshell with what's attack in numbers. So if we think about attack, attack is we've broken it down into three segments. We've got Waterfall City. Um, this comprises of the all the land holdings that we are building in Waterfall City, including the um, buildings, uh, which are very notable is the Mall of Africa and the big iconic tower, PwC Tower, that represents a value of around about 14.2 billion of our portfolio and very much the largest component of our asset grouping. The rest of South Africa um, is our retail precinct malls that we've got um, situated throughout South Africa. 7.1 billion and then other investments, which is outside South African borders, is uh, three malls in Africa, which is co-owned with ourselves and Hyprop, and then a 6.5% holding in mass, which is an Eastern European retail focus fund with also some residential. So that basically makes up attack um, in a nutshell. If we think about attack and, and what is our strategy, um, we, we, we are very much purposed to create smart, safe and sustainable community spaces providing a remarkable experience in our managed precincts. We're really not a fund that buys standalone buildings uh, and, and take an opportunity of a certain buildings. We firmly believe our real estate, um, the future of real estate sits in managed precincts. We do not only control the experience within the building, but how do you get to the building, the security, the cleanliness, the potholes we fix. So for us, property doesn't start and end at the front door. It starts with an whole experience. And, and that's really the focus of where that focuses on, and that is our, how we would acquire and also how we would develop properties. And then with our vision saying we're creating sustainable value for all stakeholders. In the past, we would have always spoke about just to our shareholders. But we really believe is creating a value-based strategy is, is for all stakeholders. We believe that within our precincts, we can create a positive impact for our communities as well as the environment we operate in and really bringing a holistic approach and a sustainable approach within our communities. Um, I think we can all remember last year, about a year ago, we, we had the terrible riots in Gauteng and in Johannesburg. And I can firmly report that it is our communities that has helped and protected the waterfall precinct largely, um, you know, 
taking us through those uncertain times and, and had no rise um, in any of our assets. If we will break down our strategic focus, we, we've got our assets, which is waterfall assets, rest of South Africa and other investments. And we embed it by capital structure. And we'll talk a little bit about the capital structure um, in, in, on the next slide. And then our employees and the culture. And, and really, our firmly belief is that without a great culture, um, we, we cannot do what we do in attack. And we cannot manage our precincts and then we cannot give it the love and attention that it needs. And it's underpinned by our ESG strategy, our innovation and technology. And, and we'll touch a little bit on, on that also today is it's a big driving force. But nothing stands alone. Everything is integrated within our company to ensure that we create sustainable value for our shareholders. Looking at what is Waterfall City, and I quite, there was a press article towards the end of last year where the press, I, I quite liked what the journal wrote, and, and we almost had no imp uh, input into the article. It said, the president and government is talking about building smart cities, but this developer is actually doing it, and they were referring to us. And, and I thought that is it's quite a very nice article that came out. And just to explain the magnitude of what Waterfall City is, is you'll see that the big boundary and Waterfall is consisted of two and 2,200 square meters of, of 200, 2,200 hectares of development. We all the red um, that you can see is the attack owned and controlled real estate we we also believe that we cannot do everything on our own so there's multiple partnerships within this precinct but what we would like to illustrate is it's a that plays a big role in a much bigger precinct that that the land owner owns there's about twenty five thousand employees that daily come in and out brenda Oh, sorry, Jackie, you've got on mute. Jackie, sorry, we can't still hear you. Do you want to just check? Can you guys hear me? We just had a loud sharing switch over. Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, maybe I can um, I'm, I'm unmuted here. Yeah. It's loud. Are we back on? Yeah. Okay. okay. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, apologies for that. We just had um, a switch over in loud sheet. Um, okay. So 25,000 employees um, in attack, or not in attack, in the waterfall precinct. We've got a heliport. Um, eight schools, Zek Hospital. These are all amenities that we have not built. This is this is amenities that was built by um, the landowner, the regional landowner. Um, Six thousand completed residential units, up with twenty thousand planned units. So really, waterfall being in the middle of cutting and, and really a very very special piece of land, attracting multi international um, clients um, for us, and then also it's anchored by the Moor of Africa um, that was built six years ago. If we talk about financial overview, uh, we're really talking about our capital structure. And our capital structure is all about having a sustainable capital structure, having a capital structure that we we are a REIT, we're a real estate investment trust that, that uh, will resume dividends um, in October again, but we're also a development company. So the balance between capital uh, um, allocation um, is, it becomes quite a tricky um, game for us. But we firmly believe we, we attack is coming out of COVID, we, we're really in a much stronger capital structure um, point of view. Our interest cover ratio is 1.5, medium term view. Raj would always say that we would like to achieve a, a two sale profit on our first sectional title unit sold that in Waterfall with the ellipse is 65.9 million. Um, our gearing 
below 40%, always been a target um, to get it below 40%. And I think coming strong out of COVID, having our gearing below 38%, uh, 40%, and then available liquidity of 1.8 billion, um, really boasting as well, um, coming out of the um, out of COVID, no more rental remissions that we provide our clients. So we really are looking forward to, um, you know, not giving any rental remission and collecting all of our rent. Looking at our portfolio in South Africa, um, this is our really our um, collaboration hubs, our mixed-use precincts. We were situated throughout South Africa. Um, we've got Acreset Mall, Rosewood Mall in, um, in the Western Cape. And then we've got Moirafir, and then Linwood Bridge, and then the Waterfall Precinct. If we talk about what is our asset management focus, and, and really Michael and his team focus is, um, we've got our retail experience, up, which is largely our malls um, situated throughout South Africa, and it's all about our shopper and the experience. Um, it's, it's quite fortunate that we've got today um, a, the, the um, unlock our stock with the capital appreciation team as, as our team has been in close works with, with some of the subsidiary companies in either the designing the shopping app um, that is busy being piloted in all of Africa and as well as Acrestock Mall. And that really is an example of how two companies can work together to bring a remarkable experience or testing a you know, experience of bridging that gap of keeping your shopper in the palm of their hands, but then bringing them back to buy bricks and mortar and also a very important the loyalty factor. The collaboration hubs is our office space. We really see the interaction of our physical space and collaboration. We've seen coming out of COVID the, the need of the office space changing. We also see that the people are returning more and more frequently back into the office. Numbers that we are starting to see is between 60 to 70 percent people more returning back to the office. So we see that the future of collaboration space might look different in a space where it's physical space, but more collaborative than just coming and to do your work. We've seen that COVID has shown that people can do their work from anywhere, but you cannot build a company um, if you're not together in a boardroom and, and collaborating. And then logistics hubs, um, an integrated office workplace requirement. Again, with the environment that we are building in Waterfall, we are more and more seeing a consolidation of, of head office and logistic warehouses merging into one and, and really um, offering um, all of the type of workers a clean, green, um, and a functional precinct. This is also embedded in our asset management by operational sustainability, our community focus, our integrated digital platform, and our customer-focused service. What does our South African portfolio look like in numbers? Our collection rate um, in December was just under 95%. Our occupancy sits at 92%. The reversion rate of our rentals, so this is rentals that revert um, when we renew our um, rentals, so the leases, was only 8 0.3%, which we feel is quite good, uh, seeing where the rest of the market is reporting double-digit reversions. And then average escalation rate of 6.2%. We've also seen our trading density recover really well post-COVID. So trading density is the amount of turnover each tenant of ours um, uh, you know, collect over a, um, over a month, and that's divided by the tradable area in our um, malls. That is 8.7% growth um, from last year. And we've also seen a great recovery in our entire portfolio. People are back, they're shopping, they're out. And, and today marks for me the first day of no COVID with having no masks. So we definitely will see another footfall increase um, with more restrictions being lifted from a more point of view. When we go to waterfall, um, we're not going to stand so much still on, on the numbers. However, under completed um, for the year was 32,000 square meters. Maybe notable, as I've just said, the cotton on head office and distribution center. As I said, that merge of office and um, distribution center in, in one. Very much a big drive for cotton on in bringing the online um, distribution center in the middle of Gauteng. What are we busy with at the moment? David is busy with um, 34,000 square meters of development. And then I think my very notably is the Vantage data center, which is a hyperscale data center in partnership with Vantage. Um, and this is phase one of three phase development that we are currently completing. 
Okay. The residential um, developments, we've got phase one of ELIPS, and I've noted that we've had 65 million rand of profit. Phase two currently is under construction. We've got just 20 more units left in phase two, so very successful phase two launch. We're hoping to launch phase three in the next few weeks. And then the mix, which has also been launched in marketing phase, um, which is a different product, which is your nano smaller apartments. I think we're going to skip over the video, but we will load it for everyone um, due to timing constraints and, and the load sharing. Um, other investments, our mass investments, as we said, six and a half percent for now, medium term hold, um, not a long term hold for attack, but a great currency for us at this stage. The rest of Africa. Currently busy um, in the disposal process. We've been quite clear to dispose the, the assets. Um, the Akecha Mall is the disposal ongoing. And then the Ad Africa, which is two malls in Ghana, currently um, under term sheet ex, um, execution at this stage. ESG, from an ESG point of view, um, our focus is really understanding what drives our business and making sure that our business is um, supported by our ESG strategy. We've currently signed a power purchase agreement to provide 50 megawatts of clean energy. We're also busy with a rooftop solar build um, to further um, enhance our rooftop solar um, and really driving cost efficiencies and then also our carbon footprint um, within attack. Community work, very important to us um, with a lot of financial assistance um, to, to bursary holders and then also a school that we've adopted. And then our governance um, with our gender and race based diversity new, new targets, targets that are set from a board level. level. Last, Last slide. slide. What, what, is, what, what are we focusing on with the next, next um, 12 months in attack? attack. Our, our precinct precinct focus, focus is um, leasing South Sea and, and, and Waterfall, Waterfall Circle. Circle. We've got, got some, some non core assets that they're currently disposing of. of. We, we are bulk, bulk reallocation plan in, in Waterfall is always, always a big. Focus, focus for us, us uh, with more in increasing our logistics rollout. We, from, from a capital, capital point of view, view is, as, as I said, said um, the reach status is for us, um, a very important and massive medium, medium term, term hold. Our distribution, distribution income per share guidance is uh, 46 to 41.88 cents per share. And, and then, then we will continue with our energy strategy, strategy with our energy, energy initiatives uh, to further enhance our business. business. Uh, and then Thank you, Marilis, and uh, welcome everybody. So um, we have we have ten to twelve minutes, and I've got a lot to talk about. So I'm going to talk quickly um, and flip through some of these slides. But it's delightful to be here with all of you. Um, we released results two weeks ago, and um, I am pleased to say that as an organisation, we are really firing on all cylinders. Uh, capital appreciation, who are we and what do we do? So fundamentally, we have two reportable divisions. We have a payments business and we have a software and services business. We also then have some operations internationally, which I'll go through, and an enterprise development initiative in the form of GovChat. Within payments, we have a company called African Resonance, which is responsible for payment infrastructure primarily for large established banks and financial institutions. We have a payment processing business called DashPay. And then we have a number of other products that we offer within payments. Layer is a save now, pay later business. And Halo Dot is a fantastic business focused on um, growth initiatives in the informal sector. Um, I will give you a quick snapshot of, of who we are. We acquire, we develop, we help entrepreneurs grow and innovate in the financial services sector. We have a, just under a billion rand of revenue. We have a market cap in just in excess of 2 billion rand. Uh, we have 427 employees and we operate and deliver services in more than 20 countries around the globe. Um, our payments business, I would say, is the largest provider of payment infrastructure to financial institutions. We have more than 277,000 payment devices in the market. Those would be the devices that you and I and everybody else uses to make credit or debit card payments. 
Our payments transaction activity has grown by more than 12 and a half times in the last four years. And our software business is the leading partner for Amazon Web Services initiatives across the African continent. We were nominated the Sub-Saharan African as the Sub-Saharan Africa Partner of the Year by Amazon, and we were involved with GovChat as the Social Impact Partner of the Year. So, COVID has had many effects. The one is it drove all of us to do more things digitally, not only us but also companies with whom we engage, trying to do things remotely. And that has had a phenomenal impact on our business. So we are a beneficiary of COVID. The demand that we have enjoyed over the last year has been phenomenal. Our results, which I will show you in a minute, were fantastic. And every corporate is thinking about how digital impacts their business because it is impacting everything that we do as individuals in our daily lives. Just a quick view of who some of our customers are. We started in the financial services sector. Many of those logos were familiar to you. We've moved into retail, into healthcare, into telecoms and logistics, building on the financial services experience that we had. In terms of our overall performance, um, our earnings per share and our dividends per share were up in excess of 30% in the last financial year. Our revenues, um, uh, are up more than 30%. And across the board, we are doing very well. Importantly, we have more than 530 million Rand of cash on our balance sheet, which gives us lots of flexibility to invest in our business and grow the business as time proceeds. To demonstrate that the business is doing well across all of our sectors, our revenue for the group was up 34%. As it so happens, coincidentally, the payments business was also up 34%, as was the software business. Our EBITDA margins, which is a sense of our profitability, was up 46%, and our operating profit was up 54%. Very interestingly, our operating margins and our EBITDA margins were up um, by 240 basis points and 320 basis points, respectively. And I think that shows the sense of the business. In terms of our dividends and our cash flow, we are highly cash generative businesses over five years, the last five years, which is since we've owned these businesses, we've generated just under a billion rand of cash flow. And we have paid 374 million rand of that by way of dividends to shareholders. In terms of highlights for the period, uh, you can see the size of our terminal estate, which are the devices in the market. We have grown from just under 50,000 in, in April of 17 to 277,000 at the end of March, uh, a real function of the success that we are having as a company. Um, we have a full range of services and in the payment sector and the growth in our client base, I think is evidence of that. Where we have focused historically is on the top end of the retail sector, large corporates, large um, retailers, but there is a real drive to move down the merchant staff and we have a number of products related to that. Halo Dot is specifically one of those. It allows anybody with an Android-based NFC phone to become a, an acceptor of credit and debit cards. So we are certified by Visa, MasterCard, and American Express, and this has application globally. Um, we think that there's approximately 25 million devices that will be enabled within um, the next few years. We spoke about, in the context of um, Jackie's presentation, she spoke about some of the things that they are doing in the Mall of Africa. We have worked very closely with the attack group to develop an app called the Shopping app. It has some really exciting features to it. And for anybody who registered today, 
and submit their cell phone numbers at the time that you registered. You will soon receive an SMS with a 100 Rand gift voucher for spending either in the Mall of Africa or in Akerstadt. Um, go and have a cup of coffee and a snack on us. Try out our technology and see the attack precinct for yourself. We have a, a Save Now Pay Later initiative under the brand of Layup. It's not Buy Now Pay Later, which is a credit product. We take no credit risk. We are just a provider of the underlying technology. In software, I've already spoken about our um, award as the AWS partner. We generated 300 million rand in new business, which was contracted in the 2022 financial year, which ended in March. We are having a really good continuing 2023. Um, we have some really great products and verticals across the globe. Uh, and we have um, an office which we opened up in the Netherlands. The activities that we perform and why we're experiencing this high demand is because we are in areas that require very specialized expertise that are in high demand, particularly given the trend towards digitalization across the economy. I spoke about the partner of the year. And the question is, what does cloud do for us? What does AWS do? McKinsey issued a report which said that the value of cloud is going to generate more than a trillion dollars of value for those who actively participate in it. And so that's a huge value pool that we are working with clients to try and unlock. So um, we're, we're invested in some really exciting areas. Um, I put this up not because I'm going to give you a seminar on what Web3 is, but because I want you to, to understand that we are really at the cutting edge of technology innovation and helping uh, leading companies across the globe transform. And so we all understand Web 1, the companies and logos that, you, that you're familiar with. Web 2 is where we are today, a very platform-based economy. Web 3 is going to take us back into a decentralized environment with no intermediaries and where we get to own our own data and information. Very important area for us. GovChat um, is our public sector initiative. It's our enterprise development initiative. It's a partnership that's effectively developed between GovChat's entrepreneur by the name of Eldred Yordan and, um, and the South African government. They are the preferred provider of a platform for engagement between citizens and the government. Here are some of the things that have that have occurred, particularly in the context of COVID. There were there are more than um, 10 million active users. We have registered 13 million social grant recipients for social relief of distress grants, and technology is helping eliminate cost and speed up the ability for government to deliver the services that is critical for it. So. Um, as a company, we are really well positioned. We are in a growing market. We have some leading technology capabilities. A lot of it is proprietary. We have a very skilled and experienced management team. We have the cash resources to be able to focus on the business and execution. We don't have to consider how we're going to make payroll next month. Um, we are right at the forefront of helping companies transform and be prepared to engage with their customers in a digital way. Please use the, the voucher that we send you. You'll be able to experience the technology for yourself. Um, and our businesses are cash generative and, um, and highly profitable. So we have experienced a really good financial year 2022 and 2023 is looking to be exciting as well. So with that, I will bring the presentation to an end. I know I spoke fast, but thank you for listening. And we're, we welcome you into the breakout room. Thank you, Brad. And thank you to you and Jackie for the kind vouchers. Um, I'm sure it's going to be much appreciated giving this uh, cold winter's 
whether we are experiencing at the moment. You can now select the breakaway room um, you would like to join by clicking on the panel at the bottom of your screen. Hi everyone and welcome to the Capital Appreciation Breakout Room. I'm just going to wait for Brad to join us and then we will uh, kick off with the, the questions. He should be coming across momentarily. And uh, if you've somehow ended up in the wrong breakout room, you can uh, switch to the attack breakout room. Just click on that breakout rooms box, uh, or if you want to alternate between the two, that's also also an option. I see uh, Alan Solomon, the CFO of Capital Appreciation, is also joining us here in the breakout room. We're still just waiting for Brad. I'm not sure where he's disappeared to, unless he's clicked the wrong breakout room, perhaps. Let me just check where he is. Brad, are you here with us? Uh, Alan, maybe I can throw the first uh, question to you. Um, while we're while we're waiting for we're waiting for Brad, um, <clears throat> can I just check your audio, Alan? I just okay. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Probably one for the CFO. Uh, if I if I if I can say it. Um, I wanted to just touch on you know we're we're definitely into a rising interest rate environment um, both in South Africa uh, and globally. I just want to take on how you and the Treasury are actively looking to you know maximize you know, kind of the the cash that you've got on the balance sheet, but also as, as part of the layup business as it grows, you know, it's going to create quite a substantial load, you know, over time, a bit a la the kind of Berkshire model. So I just wanted to talk through maybe like how you can kind of maximize that and how you're thinking about managing, you know, the large cash balance of the balance sheet, but also the float that's going to come through with the layup business. Uh, thank you, Mark. Yes, uh, um, we're fortunate, as uh, Brad indicated in the presentation, we have uh, asset light businesses, they're very cash generative, and we are uniquely positioned that we're generating very strong operating cash flows, and that we build up a substantial arsenal of cash for uh, the opportunity of organic growth within our businesses and acquisitive growth going forward. We have a very experienced treasury management uh, process in our group where we uh, are able to access uh, 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 the funds from all our operating companies and that we're allowed to have uh, centralized uh, treasury management to maximize uh, our interest opportunity on the cash uh, in hand. And I think we're proud of the fact that our our expense and our asset management has been acutely sharp over the past five years, which has assisted in that cash generation. So even though we've been moving into a lower interest rate environment, which is starting to show uh, a, a sensitivity in terms of current interest rate uh, hikes, uh, we are actually optimizing our, our interest opportunity with very minimalized risk because we're only basically utilizing uh, the facilities of A1 rated banks. Uh, on the issue on layup, we have a, only have a 27% uh, uh, equity stake in, in layup. We therefore don't, uh, we equity account for those, that business. We don't uh, consolidate it. So their cash flows are independent of ourselves. But point to note that uh, layup does not, uh, ex, is not exposed to, to credit risk. Uh, it does manage the cash flows of the transactions, but it has no credit risk uh, exposure. Um, if we just uh, stick on the on the cash balance now that uh, Brad has uh, had joined us, um, you know we've seen a huge derating in you know, technology technology businesses globally. Brad, um, are you seeing more opportunities now, uh, or more reasonably priced ones? Uh, and you know, is that something you're looking to take advantage of with the um, 
with the with the kind of arsenal that you have at your disposal are kind of vendors a bit more uh, open to uh, more multiples and reasonable multiples yeah mark thank you we we've been very judicious in how we've spent the cash and one of the areas that has limited the number of acquisitions that we've done is a disconnect between what we've seen as fundamental value and what sellers have perceived value to be given crazy multiples that have been occurring in the US public markets. With that having come in quite substantially over the course of the last number of months, we are revisiting some of the opportunities that we had seen previously and um, are continuing to explore opportunities. The great news is we have a very large cash balance and cash is not easy to raise today for a smaller company. And as a result, we are a, a partner or strategic partner of choice for many of these companies given our sector expertise and the incremental value we can add from a technology perspective. So. We are very focused on continuing to grow our business and we are seeing better priced and better valued opportunities for us and our shareholders. If we can just say on the acquisitions theme for a, for a second, future acquisitions, should we expect more um, in the international space to kind of help balance the you know, big South Africa exposure that comes from synthesis and, and, and more broadly the, the payments business? Or, you know, could we see an acquisition in, in South Africa where it, it just happens to be, you know, the opportunity that presents itself? So we're, we're not focused on, on geographic diversity as a key tenant of our acquisition focus. Um, we are much more focused on adding value. And our view is that lots of the technologies that are grown in South Africa have broad applicability in other jurisdictions like Halo Dot. In the context of the responsive transaction, we did invest in some of their international operations in the Netherlands, and that was a byproduct. It wasn't a core tenant of why we were interested in the responsive group. So we are much more interested in the underlying businesses than we are as a fundamental issue, their geographic diversity. Geographic diversity is good, but it's not the driving force of our acquisitions. And I, I also wanted to touch on an, another theme that's very prominent in the market at the minute, supply chain disruptions uh, globally. Um, and the, people might have caught one of your other presentations, but can you just give us a bit of a background on what you've done in terms of shoring up supply with, with regards to the payment term, terminals and what's gone on there so that you can you know, meet demand now and have kind of rejigged that so it's, it's a much more uh, solid supply chain in response to kind of what's been going on the last 12, 18 months. Yeah, so when we first invested in the business, there was a single supplier of devices that we had within the group, and that was a company based out of France called Ingenico, which is the world leader in payment devices. But we soon realized that there is a need for a second source to diversify your risk. And also um, there are some experiences and expertise that resides in China that we found quite attractive. So we, we secured a second supplier in the form of Newland Payment Technologies, which is the second largest manufacturer and supply of devices worldwide. And we hadn't anticipated COVID and the supply chain issues, but it's a good thing that we did uh, put in place the relationship with Newland because we have seen that they have been much more adroit and adept at managing their supply chain issues and has Ingenica, which has expanded the, the delivery time to a number of months, whereas Newland still is within a reasonable delivery time frame. So um, we continue to work closely with our suppliers and also with our customers that we make sure they order new devices with sufficient lead time so they don't run out of stock for their own operations. Yeah, great. And then uh, if we switch gears a little bit over to the to the GovChat model, uh, I mean, there's just incredible numbers that you uh, presented on that slide of you know what has been achieved to date. Um, but can we maybe just go one step further and, and just touch on the revenue model uh, and the 
potential international applications as you you know kind of referencing what you were saying before about you know stuff that is created in south africa but has international applicability can we just go uh, into the GovChat model a bit more yeah so the GovChat model has two components to it in terms of opportunity the first is what do we do with the south african government um, we don't have a revenue model in place with them yet. Dealing with the South African government is admittedly hard and difficult, um, but we have proved our bona fides and the ability of a hyperscale platform to operate in a very robust environment. Um, and that success has yielded some real international interest, not only from um, from potential customers, but also from partners. AWS themselves are currently featuring, in fact, this week, Eldred Yodan is at the RIMARS conference in Las Vegas. RIMARS stands for Robotics, Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning, and Space. It's a conference that is sponsored by Amazon, um, presenting the GovChat platform to Amazon customers worldwide. Uh, and we are working with them in partnership to see how we can make the GovChat product available to other customers, primarily their public sector customers around the world. And so we are very excited about what it will yield. The model is to provide it as a software, as a service solution, um, but we have no customers yet. So I don't want to, to overpromise. It's a work in process. We are working diligently with Amazon, but they're a really good marketing company to work with and have a really huge sales force. So if we are working hand in glove with them, I am comforted that we will have some good success. And for just to, I think also to, to give a bit of clarity uh, on layup and Alan uh, slightly touched on it with, you know, you guys not taking credit risk there, but, you know, buy now, pay later is another sector that has completely uh, disintegrated over the last uh, 12 months, whether we look at Klarna or Square or Afterpay or which, whichever one of them, they, they've all ran into the same problems. Um, can you maybe just do a quick compare and contrast between the, the layup business model that capital appreciation has against the more traditional buy now pay later uh, offerings that you know we've seen spring up over the last four or five years yeah so mark i will i will just take exception with your introduction we talk okay. about it disintegrating it hasn't okay. disintegrated but what has come off is these really crazy valuations that were being attributed to it so even in the context of of Klarna, they're out in the market trying to raise money today, and they're raising money at a multi-billion euro valuation. Um, and it's a private company that's close to startup. Um, so disintegrating is a, is a pejorative description, but what certainly <laughs> has happened is the the, the valuation multiples, we say, is disintegrated. The valuation multiples have evaporated. Of that, there's no doubt. Um, fundamentally, buy now, pay later is a credit product. It's not sold to the consumer as a credit product, but it is a credit product. You buy something, you have to pay for it over time, and if you don't pay, you get charged a fee. The fee is a substitute for interest, but it is effectively borrowing money from a third party to purchase an item today. That is the problem with buy now, pay later. It's a credit product. And in an increasing interest rate environment where the cost of borrowing increases, it becomes a more and more difficult product to finance. Uh, and there will be a higher default rate associated with it as consumers end up. Um, having their own cash flow problems. What we provide in Layup is not a credit product at all. In fact, I present it as a save now, pay later. So it is a direct savings plan effectively. You decide what you want to buy. You want to buy a mattress. You set up a plan. You make payments towards that mattress. And when you have saved up enough money for the full price of the mattress, we release that money to the merchant 
and the merchant then gives you the mattress. You do not get the mattress in advance of making your full payments. And so we provide the management solution and the payment infrastructure to, facil to facilitate that. And we get to hold the float in many instances during that interim period. If you cancel your plan, you get nearly all your money back. There is a small breakage charge of 1% that is kept by the merchant um, as a reward for holding that inventory aside for you. So a very different approach. It's a directed savings plan as opposed to a credit product. And then if we, ju if we just stay on layup for a second, um, initial feedback from, from the, the retailers that uh, have taken layup on board uh, and then, you know, layup's applicability again, you know, to move into other markets in Africa with some of the, you know, um, SA based retailers or interest from you know, international retailers who, you know, have seen the benefit of trying buy now, pay later <coughs> and maybe putting that on as a separate offering. You can do buy now, pay later or you can do save now, pay later. Yeah, so um, the retail response has been very positive. So we started out only in the e-commerce environment. And in that context, we have seen completion rates, meaning the number of people that start and ultimately finish the plan and make the payments in the high 90s. So um, it's, it really is a good product. It, does, it doesn't have an abandonment rate that is very high at all. And therefore, the merchants are very comfortable that a lay by sale is as good as a completed sale. Um, we have seen um, some of the merchants report basket sizes increase by three times what they were if people don't have one of these lay by solutions available to them. And um, it has been a very positively received product in the hands of retailers. In the context of international opportunities, we are starting to do that, but we're doing that slowly. We're a new business, we're still in South Africa, um, and there's a huge opportunity still in front of us. So we've got to continue to focus on our own backyard before we spread our wings too far and wide. But we have had some reverse inquiry and we are in very specific circumstances looking at some international opportunities. And in terms of, you know, the, the, the SA opportunity, are you, you know, very focused on, on going after the e-commerce space first or e-commerce bricks and mortar? And then I guess within retail, is it, you know, quite focused on those larger, you know, kind of ticket items, you know, household goods, um, you know, TVs, appliances, or, you know, can it be, you know, something as, as simple as, a, you know, as, as low as kind of a, a thousand rand ticket size? So we started out in e-commerce because e-commerce is a really easy um, solution to implement. Um, you're on a website, you can click, and ultimately you can take people directly to the application form. What was much harder was to do that in bricks and mortar. And we now have a layup app available for deployment across our terminal estate, which is one of the reasons that layup was interested in us with over 270,000 devices in the market. And why we thought it was a really good product to add to our devices. So it is now available to dash pay merchants who are using our Newland devices and we are looking to make it available to users of our Ingenico devices as well. Um, and that's where, we, that's where we think there's huge opportunity. So uh, where we, the sectors that are using it today are larger ticket items like mattresses and jewelry. And in the travel sector, if you want to say for a, a matric matric party getaway or some big concert tickets um, they're travel agencies who are using it uh, but it is also available on many of the retail sites where you can buy a pair of shoes with with a layup um, solution and so it has broad applicability across lots of different sectors 
And uh, I'm going to just turn to capital management for a second. So I don't know if you want to take this one or Alan might want to take it. Um, what are your kind of general thoughts uh, in terms of you know keeping the buyback going? You know, we saw another decent increase in the in the in the dividend pay ratio. Are you, you know, is the board trying to get to a particular you know dividend cover or dividend pay ratio? Um, you know, given the kind of cash generative nature uh, of the business, um, you know, it's kind of really um, been a feature of the capital appreciation story, the buyback and, and the dividend payments. It'd just be interesting to to kind of get kind of the broad landscape of, of how you're thinking about it. We we don't have any specific policy um, that we're that we're um, guiding ourselves by. What we've done is evaluated the opportunity set that we have at the end of every financial period, recognizing the highly cash generative nature of our businesses. Um, and knowing what our pipeline of opportunity looks like in the short term. We have no debt. Our shares are, are available to us too. So in terms of acquisitions, um, we evaluate where we are and we have concluded that we can return value to shareholders by way of dividends. The share buyback has been relatively opportunistic. And when the share was trading in the in the high sense um, under a RAND. Um, for us, it was a screaming buy and we did that. It's, we still think it's relatively undervalued. Um, and so we'll continue to evaluate the opportunity. One of the, one of the concerns that we have is we don't want to take the liquidity of the share out of the market. And we want enough shareholders to be able to trade or get access to shares if they want to be able to do that. So we are somewhat um, constrained by, by the volume of shares that are available. All of, most of our big shareholders are big shareholders and they don't want to sell. So those shares aren't available for, for transacting. So we don't want to remove that liquidity. Yeah. And then uh, if we can just touch on uh, Halo Duck for a second, um, what uh, can we expect in terms of you know, margins from the Halo Dot business, given, uh, you know, it's quite a different model uh, to the standard payment terminals, terminals model, does it? Will it, as it scales, will it have better margins than a, the standard terminal business? Uh, or, you know, over time, will it kind of come out roughly the same, the same margins? Well, our, pay, our payments business overall has, has very good margins in the high 30s. Um, and it's a combination of hardware sales and also the payment services. So over the, over the medium to longer term, we think that Halo Dot fits nicely within that model. It is a software product. So software by its nature has very high margins. The costs that we will incur are related to product development and also customer acquisition and some of the marketing and, and initiatives around that. Um, those will evidence themselves in the early years, there's no doubt, because you don't have enough revenue flowing through the product yet to cover those costs. Um, but within our payments business and our software business, we have more than enough cash generated by those businesses to, to sustain that investment. And so um, over the longer term, I think you'll see the software element of Halo Dot emulate the same margins that we get within payments and software. Okay, all right. I see Andre is telling me we've got uh, two minutes left. So I'll just maybe squeeze in uh, one more question. Um, I know you touched on uh, in another presentation, I heard you uh, post results uh, on some potential cost savings you're, you're going to see coming down the line from a reconfiguration of office space and, you know, work from home post COVID. Um, can you maybe just talk about, you know, what, what is going to be entailed there? Is it more, you know, keeping teams working remotely uh, or is it just, you know, office landlords desperate to keep, uh, uh, you know, people in office blocks? Well, it's a, it's a combination of both, um, but we're not cutting down on our footprint. Um, in terms of real estate. In fact, we're increasing our footprint. 
when when we bought African residents and dash pay, they were much smaller businesses, 32,000 terminals in the market. We now have 277,000 terminals in the market. And over this period, we have we have continued to renew the leases that we had and expand the footprint. With the leases coming to their natural expiry, we have looked for a more purpose suited facilities. And those facilities um, happen to be at a time where there is market dislocation in the cost of rentals. And we've been able to negotiate a really good deal. So we are moving to much bigger premises, which are much more, which are better suited to a, to a high volume business of the size that we are um, at a much reduced cost. So um, we are going to benefit both in terms of footprint and in terms of cost. Okay. Um, Brad, I think we will leave it there. Uh, yeah, we're going to be moving back to the main plenary session um, in the next uh, minute. I don't think you have to There we go. Welcome, Attack team. Hello. Thanks for having us. Can you still hear an echo or is it all fine now? No, the echo, no, the echo, the echo is done. So yeah, it's all our attendees. I'm sorry about that. Attack is so good, you've got to hear them twice. And load shedding <laughs> made sure of that by, you know, throwing us some chaos there with the microphones. So Shame, Jackie, thanks for pushing through <laughs> on uh, what was a load shedding interrupted presentation. I mean, this is life in South Africa. We all deal with it. So breakout rooms are empty. So Vanessa, I'm going to sort of get us going if that's okay. Um, the way it works, the way it works, if you haven't attended and unlock the stock before is this is your chance to ask questions directly to the management team. And the way you do this is by popping me a message in the chat. So if you open up the chat at the bottom of your screen, you choose to send it to me basically, and I will then pick it up and ask the questions kind of as we go. So make the most of the opportunity. That's why we are all here ultimately. So to the team from Attack, thank you for the presentation. I must disclose I'm a shareholder. I should probably get that out the way up front. Um, very small one, but I'm a shareholder. So I think the one thing I wanted to comment on that I've certainly always found interesting about Attack is you know, that comment about not buying standalone buildings, actually focusing on a managed precinct. I just want to highlight that again, because I think that's one of the key takeouts about attacks strategy. And I think something else that sets you apart from the other REITs or many of the other REITs is your significant development pipeline. So it's not just about the existing buildings that you've got. It's actually about what you are building going forward. So for example, I picked up in your pre-close updates, I think around 32,000 you know, square meters of GLA completed this year and a similar amount is still under construction versus the total portfolio is around 659,000. So it's a meaningful chunk sitting in development. And what I want to ask you is that, you know, as a REIT, you need to think about distributable income a lot. And I think that's something that's very top of mind for you this year in terms of the need to declare a dividend, hopefully. Um, and I would imagine that this combination of development and being a REIT collecting you know, rentals really creates a lot of capital management considerations. You know, how do you allocate capital to developments? How do you think about dividends? How do you manage this quite interesting world that you exist in? So I wondered if you could just talk to some of that, you know, what are some of the top of mind things for you around how you manage your capital, given your status as a REIT and a development pipeline? Thanks, Francisco. It's, uh, it's probably the most important question we're gonna to get today. It's uh, something that we've deliberated as a management team and as a, a board quite a bit over the last 12 months. So for those that have been following Attack for some time, you'll know we started out as a capital growth fund and in uh, 2018, May, we converted into a, a REIT. And through the COVID period, we went back to sort of not, I wouldn't say the drawing board, but certainly reconsidered whether the REIT status was appropriate for a company like ourselves, you know, being pretty much a property company with a substantial completed portfolio. But like you've mentioned, uh, and you've, you've quoted some uh, GLA currently under construction and what's coming to completion. 
but roughly a, a billion rands plus worth of land that has been paid for that will develop over the next sort of you know, 10 to 15 years. And, 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 and the question you know, that we deliberated on is whether the REIT status, which obviously provides quite an attractive tax regime in terms of uh, effectively acting as a conduit for investors, uh, but requiring to pay out at least 75% of your distributable earnings out to your investors versus, you know, uh, retaining as much as you can uh, and, and redeploying that within the development pipeline to grow out the, um, you know, the, the completed portfolio even more. Um, and, and we've considered all the factors, uh, you know, and some of those factors that you've asked us to, to expand on that, certainly is, you know, where is the best allocation of capital currently? Uh, certainly, in, in an interest rate environment that we're currently in, where interest rates are increasing, and, and expected to increase for you know, at least the next 12 to, to 24 months. Uh, certainly, there's um, a case to be made to re repay debt and get an immediate guaranteed return, being the cost of your debt, um, versus allocating capital for new developments, which starts out, uh, you know, your yields are typically lower than sometimes your cost of debt. They typically start at around 8%, but then they've got a growing profile being the escalation that you secure with your tenant. Um, and so we've considered all of that. Uh, we've taken into account where we think uh, our capital requirements would look like in the sort of next 36 months, taking into account the transactions that we're busy with, but also uh, interest that we're seeing in, in the logistics sector, which is quite strong at the moment. You see that there's one of the growth areas for waterfall, uh, given <coughs> our location, given the land that we have, and also talking to retailers' expansion uh, with, the, with regards to the online uh, um, requirements or online um, uh, sales and, and logistics requiring to support that. Um, and we took all of that into account. We, we ran a, a, a number of models, sensitivity analysis and scenario analysis. And we also then contemplated, you know, the fact that uh, the minimum requirement to remain uh, a read is 75%. So you have the ability to retain 25% of your earnings. You obviously, it's subject to tax, but um, retain the majority of that and reinvest that into um, you know growing the business and the growth aspect of uh, the balance sheet, and so we made that decision. It was a poor decision. I put that to the market in our pre-close presentation, um, and certainly that takes into account allocation of capital going forward. Uh, and, and what we've done very successfully in the past is rolling out the bulk that we have or the land that we have with joint venture partners, which is another source of uh, capital for us. So, for example. If you take uh, some of our more recent developments in, in corporate campus, we've got a 50% joint venture partner there. Our Ellipse uh, development being our highly successful high, um, high density residential offering, that's what the joint venture partner where we partnered and contributed between 20 and 50% of the capital. But every time we, we find a joint venture partner that's appropriate for that development, we're actually bringing in capital. So you sell 50% of the land to that JV partner, that's part of your equity contribution to develop the top structure. And so then your, your capital requirements beyond that point become fairly minimal and you can manage that with uh, you know, a, a reasonable level of theory. Um, so hopefully that gives you some insight into how we've approached the, the, the thinking with regards to the status and, and whether it's appropriate and how we're managing the capital allocation dis discussion around new developments, allocation within our existing debt and then sourcing that capital through JVs and potentially retain some of our earnings. Yeah, that's excellent. And I think it helps set the scene of how this industry really works. So my questions are, are, are coming through thick and fast, which is nice. There's three letters that get mentioned a lot. And uh, you'll guess what they are. The first one is an N. But before we get to the NAV question, which is obviously coming, um, something that I want to ask you about is just the gearing. Uh, so the point here being, you know, you've got a gearing ratio of around 38%. I think it is you hedge around 70% of that as a matter of policy. Obviously, we had a question unsurprisingly about you know, rate hike cycle is underway, clearly. Um, that's part of why you hedge, you know, 75% of your debt. But I don't want to spend too much time on this, but perhaps just quickly you could talk about firstly, why 70%? What's the magic of that number? Why is that your hedging policy? And then secondly, how do you think about the different maturity dates of your debt and how you hedge that accordingly? Our policy isn't 70%, it's a minimum of 70%. Uh, in our pre-close presentation, we disclosed uh, the hedge percentage as a percentage of completed facility, uh, committed facilities rather, and that was around the 72% mark. 
but based on utilization, we're, we're around the 80, 81% mark. So we're, we're typically, um, <coughs> as a matter of policy, is no less than 70%. But in, I would say in the last sort of five years, we've been between 80 and 90% uh, for most of that time. And the, committed, the difference between committed facility percentage and the utilization percentage facility is that we've got committed facilities that we use as backstop facilities. So really liquidity, if we, if we think we require it, and it's really a prudent measure. And then we've got facilities that we use as working capital facilities. So during the year, as you're collecting rentals, you park that cash against an RCF, for example, and then towards the end of that incident period of the full year, you pay out a distribution and you draw on those funds. So I think the, the, the utilization percentage is potentially a, a better measure of interest rate management rather than using our committed facilities. And um, and like I said, we, we, we're more often than not between the 80 and 90% mark, which I think is, is, is probably more appropriate when you're in an interest rate hiking cycle and when interest rates are on, are, on, a, on a sort of lower cycle looking to reduce rates, then you want to kind of be less hedged because obviously there's a cost to hedging, uh, as most of you know, as you're locking either uh, rates through swaps being a fixed rate or using interest rate caps, uh, it comes at a cost. And so you want to find a balance between mitigating the interest rate risk, but also not paying this insurance premium on everything. Because if you fully hedge and, and rates are coming off relative to your peers, you're going to be looking very unattractive because you're paying high interest rates and not benefiting from a, a lower cycle. So we were, we've, we've done some work uh, many years ago. We said as a minimum, we want to be 70% hedge, but internally we, we try to sort of remain around the 80% mark. Hopefully that answers your question around yeah. the percentage. Yeah, it does. And thank you for clarifying. These are the joys of running a property fund. So look, let's deal with the NAV question because it would be terrible if we ran out of time and didn't get to it. So, <laughs> nat <laughs> so nat <laughs> naturally, everyone is asking about the big discount compared to net asset value. Um, look, it's part of why I bought shares. So, I mean, this is, this is how investing works, right? You look for these sort of opportunities. So I would imagine there is some kind of plan to close that over time. And I suppose some of the questions coming through are things like, what are the catalysts to do that? As part of that, I want to ask you about your remaining stake in mass real estate, because, you know, typically what tends to drive discounts is when a listed company owns a stake in another listed company. I mean, that's something we see across the, the JSE. And you've sold down a lot of that. But, you know, what does is, what is your plan look like with that? And anything you're willing to talk to around NAV? I mean, I've got probably five, six questions in my DMs on that. So it's clearly top of mind for your investors. Yeah, 100%. Maybe why, so why the arbitrage? Yeah, so, so maybe, maybe, maybe before we talk about the tech, maybe let's talk about the industry. Because I think the, the listed property sector and the REIT specifically have been trading at a discount for some time now. Um, I think that, that, you know, for a long time, most of the, the counters were trading at NAV or, or a premium. You know, and I think we're, we were at one stage sort of 20 25% premium. Um, that narrowed and now it's turned to a discount. Um, and then COVID hit and that, and that this kind of across the sector actually wide quite a bit. And I think talk to some of the, the challenges the industry were, was facing at the time. Um, obviously COVID restrictions impacting largely initially uh, retail focused funds with limited uh, or rather restricted trade. Um, and then the sort of longer term impact, I think has really been factored into the, the office sector, what we refer to as a collaboration hubs and around how uh, potentially COVID has been, for some firms, a catalyst in terms of working a hybrid type uh, you know, uh, operation. So in the office two to three days a week, working from home two to three days a week, um, and how that impacts the requirement or, or the need for, 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 for office space. And so I think that that, that that has obviously weighed in on the list sector significantly, and that's played a role in terms of the discount. But perhaps maybe moving on to a tech and, and the discount that we're trading at in a week, we're, we're focused on managing the business and we're obviously cognizant of where the share price is. It's not something that we have direct input in, but some of the factors that we think currently impact our discount to, to NAV is that we're not your typical REIT. So we have a substantial development pipeline at any given time. We have a couple of hundred million tied up in developments under construction, be it like industrial or logistics or um, in our collaboration hubs. And so there's a there's an element of a balance sheet that is um, I wouldn't say dependent, but 
correlated to um, development activity, which is in turn correlated to, I think, the GDP and the, and the growth of the economy, you know? And I think there's a sentiment that where we are in the current cycle with obviously um, GDP under a little bit of pressure, some of the dynamics around the property sector, like I talked about retail, which I think is unwinding. Certainly the retail numbers that we've been printing have been really, uh, really positive, but there's still, I suppose, a, a cloud over, you know, what the future of office is. It certainly isn't dead. And we see, we see a lot of deal-making activity, but the sentiment around that is to develop, you need an economy to be a sort of on the up cycle, and potentially we're not there as yet from a from an economic perspective. So, so count so investors that look at us say there's an element of our business that is geared towards development, which is not going to be um, you know firing in all cylinders for a, a reasonable amount of time, and that's weighing on it. There's also the element around yield, and typically for a long time, you know, we were one of the only. Uh, capital growth funds in the in the property sector. There was a obviously Jackie's previous life, Pivotal was also a capital growth fund. Uh, but by and large, your investor base that invests into property typically looks at income yield. They're looking at distributions and they then quantify that distribution as a percentage of either your share price or, or your NAV. And our yield has been extremely lean for a number of factors, most notably because not all of our assets pro provide income. Our obviously developments under construction for that period don't deliver any income, but also our land, which is sitting at about 1.1 billion, is, I want to call it a drag in the short term because it's not generating income. Obviously, as we convert that into income producing assets, it's a bit of a kicker to our income profile. And so I think, you know, our yield on, um, on our NAV was sub 4%. If you look at some of the other counterparts, they're probably trading around an 8 or 9%. So if you're looking purely from um, uh, you know, value in the company from a yield perspective, you're going to penalize us based on the income that we're producing relative to, you know, the asset base or the, or the equity base. So I think there's a, there's a couple of uh, factors there that I've mentioned. Sometimes potentially gearing, uh, you know, guys believe that, you know, there's a psychological 40% gearing mark that, uh, you know, either differentiates you from a sort of higher financial risk versus a lower financial risk property company. We were very deliberate in uh, the middle of COVID to get our gearing down based on low valuations, pull our gearing back down to below the 40% mark, and we're now trading at a 38% mark. So hopefully we've addressed some of the potential concerns that the market saw from a financial risk perspective. But it's something that, you know, we're, like I said, we're not directly focused on. We've got to manage the company on a day-to-day -day basis, and hopefully then, you know, if we do that right, it'll reflect in a higher share price. Um, but finance goes. Hopefully, I've added some at least some food to thought, and maybe maybe, kind of yeah, maybe you, your your one question is what are the levers that we can pull? And I think you've alluded to maybe you sell mass and bring your gearing down. Um, believe me if I tell you we run those numbers <laughs> on a almost daily basis, and you know the different you know limitations. But for us, it is that's why we Roger said it, it's for us. It's, it's focusing on our yield. So sensitive focus on you know your average in your company, every single asset. What is the yield? Uh, Michael has got a disposal list, so that's one of the leaders we are pulling. Um, it, it's not assets that we're disposing because we have to dispose assets. It's assets we are disposing because it's good asset management practice. Um, we also, as you, in our closing slide, we're looking at a bulk reallocation plan. We potentially will be selling certain of our bulk, potentially acquiring other bulk, but, but really rationalizing the bulk in, in waterfall as that is a non-income producing asset um, on our balance sheet. Africa is very active with feet on the disposal list. So, so, so there's a lot of levers we pull in. And then we firmly believe is the waterfall story is a very long-term play. We, we've, we've also had a few ups and downs. We've had black swan events over the last 10 years. Um, but building a city within the middle of Khartik is such a special offering. Um, we, we, we control everything around us. We, we provide the safety and security. And, and it's very notable type of clientele we are continually um, attracting into into waterfall so we don't expect us to fix the yield in 10 12 months time but that definitely over the next three years we're hoping to have a a much better yielding um stock thank you so we've got three minutes left and there's a spectacularly juicy well i've got a few juicy questions in my dm but i'm going to pick this one and <laughs> As this sort of discount to NAV continues, I mean, I guess with the development pipeline, it somewhat limits your ability to do share buybacks because you need the capital for your developments, whereas share buybacks would be a lever that a lot of funds would use. So here's the tough question, and you've got about two minutes to answer it. 
Have you given any thought to the risk of a potential takeover at this price of the group, given that it is at such a discount to NAV? Yes, we have. Um, we're also very expensive. Um, you need to take over just under your 10 billion rands with the gearing. Building development and the expertise of building um, waterfall out is, is a different um, ball game. Um, so it's not that easy taking over a tech if you want to step into the waterfall land lease. Uh, there is also pre interest so potentially you could buy a tech but then lose out on the waterfall land. So it, it, it's not that easy to, to step in and take waterfall over. There we go. I thought it was going to take longer than two minutes to answer, but it didn't. So look, I think we've covered a lot of really cool concepts around property funds and how to manage them. I mean, I've had some other questions asking for, you know, guidance on earnings, et cetera. I mean, you guys need to store release results. You'll discuss that there. I'm not going to ask you those questions yet because you just can't give that guidance. So I, given we've only got about a minute left, I just wanted to say thank you um, and for answering so candidly. Some of these questions were not easy and yeah, in terms of discount to NAV, obviously all the investors are kind of watching this. I think just from my side, it was fun to watch the share price trade in such a tight range for a long time. There were good opportunities to make like 10% at a time. You know, for those of us who, don't, uh, who aren't directors, you need to announce that stuff and get permission. But it has now broken lower. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. And um, yeah, maybe some share buybacks to come, obviously finishing up the development portfolio. And it sounds like there's some agility in your development plan as well. So to the extent offices don't quite recover, you know, there's a lot of people converting to Resi at the moment. I would imagine that's something that's not impossible given where Waterfall is. So yeah, congrats and uh, keep it up. And I think we can probably leave it there. I believe we've only got about a minute left. Thank you so much, so much for the Thanks support. I think we'll be taken back to the main room shortly just to wrap it up. Uh, the finance ghost, I'm just going to jump in here. You might want to ask a few more questions. I think Andre is going to put up a note to tell us when we'll go across. Obviously staying busy there in capital appreciation. Okay, let me ask <laughs> one more then. Can you talk to this concept of potentially converting office to resi? Is that something you've thought of? Is it something, I mean, it's obviously what's happening in the market, but just any thoughts on that for a minute or two? We actually spoke about this one um, asset that um, in Michael's portfolio in Pretoria that we said we potentially could uh, convert, but it doesn't work. Um, but our portfolio is so new and we've got so much land. It, it pays us to actually build new stock. It's, it's the better return for us. And we don't have, other than the transit building, which is, the, the, that's the only big vacancy we have in our portfolio. You know, the, the, the crazy conversion works in a node that is no longer friendly to, to office and it's either deteriorating for, for whatever reason or is changing from an office node to a residential node. And if you look at Waterfall, you know, it's a city. And so our offices, like Jackie said, is, is new, it's P grade, still attracting a very good tenant base. And so there's no there's no requirement to convert our our stock into resi. Like Jackie said, there's only one building that's uh, that's vacant really that you know we're trying to solve for. And we've got, and, and, and we will solve for it. But by and large, our occupancy rates are very high. Um, outside of Waterfall, we may have identified one other building that you know we could look at repurposing. Um, but it's you know the conversions are <coughs> very high vacancies, and the outlook for that node is skewed towards residential and not office, and and, and that isn't really relevant uh, for a tech. It's certainly not for, uh, for Waterfall. So I'm going to ask one more thing and we may get cut off while you answer it, but I noted in your pre-close update, um, trading densities grew pretty well at Mall of Africa, sort of Garden Route, Stellenbosch. I mean, these are the sort of growth areas in South Africa. I think you mentioned waterfall is around 63% of your total assets. So I think a lot of people see ATAC as the, the waterfall fund, right? I mean, I think if you just shook someone, that's what they would say. I uh, see this is closing in 60 seconds. 45 seconds worth of commentary on, are you going to be investing in the rest of the country, given your managed precinct story, or are you, are you focusing where you are? We, we, we also debate this a lot. We love the diversity. Um, we might um, sharpen the, the diversity to, in, to for less precincts, but we, we really love the fact that we've got Western Cape and hunting exposure um, within our portfolio. It gives us bargaining power with our retailers. Um, so not, not, we won't be just a waterfall fund. 
I got it. All right. Now we really are going to be going back to the main room. Thank you very much to you guys, to the team for attending and to everyone for your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone that has participated in Unlock the Stock today. A special thank you to Jackie and Rajay, as well as Brad, Michael and Alan for making the time in their busy schedules to support this retail investor platform. We, we hope you have enjoyed this event and if you would like to listen to it again, it will be on the Caterwreck Investor Solutions YouTube channel later this afternoon or first thing tomorrow morning. Please join us next week on 30 June 2022 at 12 o'clock for an Unlock the Stock session with Teresa Minerals, the world's only co-producer of both platinum group metals and chrome concentrates. Goodbye and thank you.